Hello, fellow rebel capitalists. Hope you're well. I'm here with my good buddy, Jason Hartman, the real estate expert, and we are going to do a deep dive into residential real estate. You're not going to want to miss this. Buddy, what's up? We've got a lot to talk about here. Hey, how you doing? I got to tell everybody how you uh, start a show. I, yeah. we're, we're, we're shooting the breeze for a few minutes. And then I said, hey, what do you want to talk about? And he says, I don't know. Let me hit live. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> right. But well, first and foremost, we got to tell everyone, remind everyone to get their tickets to Rebel Capitalist Live Absolutely. ASAP because you're going to be there with uh, Kenny McElroy, with Peter Schiff. I don't even yeah. know if I told you that. You know, Schiff is going to be I there. Schiff's coming. I heard you talk about it on a video the other day. Yeah. And Mike Maloney and Lynn Alden and Snyder and uh, Brent Johnson. Yep. And it, it's going to be a lot of fun. So you're not going to want to miss Hartman talk about residential real estate. Uh, even further. So definitely get your tickets at rebelcapitalslive.com. But well, let's first and foremost talk about mortgage rates. I know all people are always interested in that. We've got the 10-year. Uh, let's see, it's around 3.5 right now. It went down to about 3.3 and then it's gone back up. And the reason I'm doing talk about the 10-year because I'm using it as a proxy for mortgage rates. Yep. So I'm assuming that mortgage rates in the last, uh, what, probably three or four months have been pretty volatile. Yeah, as far as kind uh, of going up and down. So, and I know you probably don't follow the tenure, but you do follow the mortgage rates. So, right. kind of what's happening there, and how are realtors responding to this, and mortgage brokers, and the marketplace in general? Yeah, mortgage rates uh, kind of suck. Uh, you know, everybody's uh, everybody's not happy about that. But um, you know, it's it's interesting. Uh, people are definitely out buying. I mean, business has been actually quite good for us, surprisingly good. Uh, which I'm very grateful for. Last year, when we hit that initial spike for about two or three months, George, it was quite slow. Uh, but um, it's since uh, recovered. But that very was slow nicely. because you didn't have any inventory, right? It's not like well, you didn't have buyers, you just didn't have sellers. We still don't have much inventory, but there was uh, two or three months there where people were just freaking out and not really buying either. So it was oh, okay. kind of a, a kind of a a double thing and inventory oddly is just gone down again. Uh, it went down by about 7,000 homes in the past week. We're now at about 405,000 homes for sale in the country. Mm. We had 412,000 a week ago. So inventory is actually declining. And um, you know, that strikes some as very odd and kind of unbelievable, but, but it's true because the, the sellers just, they don't want to exchange their cheap mortgage, the 25% of them that have a mortgage below 3% or 65% of them that have a mortgage below 4%. They right. don't want to trade that in for a 6.5% mortgage. Why would they? So 405,000 total homes for sale in the United States right now. Yep. What did that compare to like prior to COVID? What was kind of a norm? Yeah, uh, before COVID, um, you know, it depends when you ask. And I actually got a chart here. I'll just pull it up. I can look right at it. Right at the top of my head, I, I want to say like 500,000, but maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, well, it depends when you ask, you know, because if you go back to, uh, you know, if you go back seven years, uh, inventory was about triple what it is now in 2015, 2016. And uh, right before COVID here, I'll just tell you in a second. Um, so if you want to look at 2019, um, right at this time, time of year in 2019, inventory was about the same. Uh, but later in 2019, it, oh wait, sorry, I'm looking at the wrong chart. Boy, that's really bad, isn't it? That's bad. <laughs> sorry about that. I take that back. See, this is the problem with live. No, 2019 inventory was about double what it is now at this time of year. And okay. then later in the year, like, you know, same time, it went up even higher than that to almost 1 million homes in 2019. Mm -hmm. And that's when you were really doing some great work covering the repo market, which no one was paying attention to. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Okay. So low inventories. Now, when you're talking about the, the, the price increase or a lot of buyers out there, are you focusing pretty much exclusively on the markets where you do business or the entire United States? In terms of what? When you were talking about how there's still being a lot, there's still a lot of buyers out there. We're still, you know, seeing multiple offers for homes. Is that just in the markets that you're in? Therefore, you're just watching those like a hawk, or is that more so the United States in general? Um, it's definitely not just the markets we're in. 
Um, but I would say that it's not in the cyclical type markets, George. It's mostly in the more linear markets. The cyclical markets are definitely struggling more so because- Can you, you know, explain that a bit just for people who might not have watched one of your videos when you're talking about a linear market or a cyclical sure. market and how the cyclical markets might be showing maybe even nominal price declines? Yeah, more more distress in the cyclical markets. Three basic types of markets, linear, cyclical, hybrid markets. Cyclical are all the markets you hear about on the news. They get all the attention because they're sensational, right? So they're the West Coast of the United States, the expensive Northeastern markets, South Florida, where I live, the expensive markets are the cyclical right. markets, right? right? And the rest of the country pretty much is linear with a few hybrid markets uh, tucked in there that are are sort of boring and they don't get a lot of attention. Uh, but um, uh, the you know the the higher they fly, the harder they fall, right? Or the further they fall, and that's just true of cyclical markets because they fly higher and they fall farther. So those markets are definitely experiencing more distress than the linear markets. Linear markets just slight price declines. Um, it's definitely not like everything has multiple offers anymore. I mean, multiple offers are, they happen, but they're somewhat rare. You okay. know, they're, they're not, it's not crazy like it was before, which personally, George, uh, this is my favorite type of market. I like this type of market because you can operate. Contrary to popular belief, someone who's in the brokerage industry, you know, most of the public will say, oh my gosh, you got to love this market. You're making money hand over fist. Actually, no. Really uh, strong markets are very hard to operate in. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's just, I mean, imagine if you had a store, if you're a retailer, if you sell shoes, whatever, right? And you don't have very many shoes to sell. And every time you get a new pair of shoes, you know, 30 people want to buy it, right? That's yeah, just right. a lot of work, honestly. Uh, you don't sell more shoes, right? You just got more to deal with managing 30 buyers that want to buy the shoes. So uh, I'd rather have, you know, a good solid amount of inventory, which we still don't have, uh, and a more normal, even keel uh, stream of buyers. That's a better market for in my opinion, at least. Yeah. And I, again, I want to be specific here. We're talking about linear markets. This is what Jason specializes in and also kind of the single family starter homes. Yeah. So it, we wouldn't be talking about, you know, even in a, say, in Indiana or a Kansas City, we wouldn't be talking about a, a five or six hundred thousand dollar house. Uh, we'd be talking about, well, now it's going to be a lot higher, but now maybe a two hundred and fifty or yeah. three hundred thousand dollar house in that market would be considered a starter home. Yeah. And interestingly, George, uh, you know, entry level, if you're talking new construction is more expensive than that in most cases. Really? You know, you're, oh, you're talking 300, 350. Yeah. I mean, people are buying 400, $450,000 rental houses now, you know, because there's just yeah. so little inventory in that really cheap entry level market. Yeah. It, it's, I was on doing a live stream last night on Rebel Capitalist Pro and there was a, a gal in there. I, I won't say her name, but she was telling her own personal story about living in, she said, you know, Southern California. So I'm assuming La Jolla or something like that. And she sold her house in 2020. And now her rent payment is double what yeah. her mortgage payment was. And her, and she's, and she has to rent like this crappy, like two bedroom, you know, thousand square foot, uh, li yeah. little, you know, townhouse or something like that. And her rent was twice what her mortgage is. And, um, you know, it was just, she was kind of asking me what to do. And I, I hopefully yeah. I gave her some decent advice. But, uh, boy, it's right now people are really pinched. I mean, oh, yeah. you know, what do you do? Uh, do you buy a house and, and pay an extremely high price with a very high mortgage rate? Or do you rent and you're getting yeah. squeezed there? It's like, it's crazy. You know, the important thing is to just be in the game, right? You know, you don't have to own the house in which you live. Just be in the game and own some investment property, right? Um, and, you know, but but when you look at these surveys, and I'm sure you've seen them, you've probably reported on them, George, although I haven't noticed you reporting on them, but I'm sure you probably have, uh, where they show like the average net worth of a homeowner versus a renter, right? And the homeowners are always wealthier, you know, by by an order of magnitude, frankly. So it's a, it's a big difference in net worth because- Well, it depends they can, when they do the study though. If they do the well, study in 2012, it's not going to be that way. If fair they do enough. The study in 2018, yeah. it's just yeah. based on what the housing market is doing with the equity. 
Sure, sure. But but over time, like generally, right, um, you know, that homeowner has the opportunity to fix their payment for three decades, whereas the renter doesn't. They're going to get a rent increase probably every year. Yeah, yeah. And, and yeah. so so that's part of it. Plus, they're taking advantage of inflation induced debt destruction, tax benefits, et cetera, et cetera. And at the very least, even if you're not financially sophisticated, owning that home is kind of a forced savings program. And the same is true of all these things with investment properties, right? So you don't have to own the home in which you live. Could just be a rental property. But since equity is somewhat hard to access most of the time, you know, it it is a place where you save money. And, you know, if you're a spendthrift, you tend not to spend it because it's not easy to access. So... Yeah, but I think like this gal, she wasn't coming at it from a standpoint of being a real estate investor. Right. She was just kind of, you know, just a, a normal person that didn't really want to get in the real estate game. She was just trying to put a roof over her head. I agree. And, and yeah. unfortunately, being in California right now, because of the crazy policies that we've had since 2020 and before, uh, that it, it's harder and harder for these these people to do, even if they've got a, a very good job. And it's just you know, you feel really sorry for the people. And then, you know, we sit here, we're talking about nominal prices. We're talking about nominal price declines in California, the West Coast, these cyclical markets. But what happens when you throw in the rate of inflation? Oh, yeah. You know, let's not forget that year over year inflation just a few months ago was 9.1%. Oh, yeah. So yeah. if you're, the houses in your neighborhood go down by 10% in nominal terms, well, now you got to tack on an additional 10%. When you adjust for the price of inflation, you're down 20% in a year. Oh, yeah. You know, it's 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 just terrible. A lot of people are definitely getting pinched, um, you know, and there's a lot of other pressures on people besides housing costs, which are definitely high. I mean, affordability has plummeted. It's that actually strengthens the rental market, which is what's interesting for investors. You know, it, it's funny how people think, right? You know, uh, they think, oh, well, the market's up, it's down, it's sideways. But they generally are only talking about the sales market and what sales prices are doing and mm -hmm. values rather than rents. And right. when you get in a market like this, yeah, the, the sales prices are only increasing by a small amount overall. Uh, but the rents, there's a lot of upward pressure on rents. And the rent surveys mostly that you see uh, that show this deceleration in rents, and granted, they're not accelerating the way they used to, but they're still not declining, um, are mostly for institutional apartment style investments, because those are the things that are surveyed. There's right. very little of that that is applicable to the single family home market. I mean, and I always ask my investors this, and George, you know, you've owned many properties. On your single family homes, did you ever get a call from a researcher asking what you were doing with your rents? Are you increasing them? Are you decreasing them? Are you giving incentives for people to move in? No, they survey big apartment owners to find that out because they can, you know, they can hear about 300 to 3000 units in one phone call. Right. And don't and, they have that know, info on Zillow or something? Uh, they do. Zillow has the Zori, the uh, Zillow observed rent index, and that is better, but it still really isn't covered very well for single family homes. Um, the, the, I was going to mention the Zori. That's about the best thing we've probably got. Okay. And other um, companies and groups like Altos, they've sort of created their own single family home rental index, but that data is still not extremely reliable. And, you know, again, I'll tell you, Zillow doesn't know what I'm renting my houses for. Yeah. Yeah. The, with the rents, the, my concern is we have had two plus years of negative real income growth. Right. You know, yes, nominal wages have gone up. But when you adjust for inflation, people are making less bad. now than they yeah. were in 2019. But yet they're paying more for everything. Yep. Uh, including rent. And at some point that the rent, you know, it, it just can't continue to go up unless you have a property uh, that's in very, very high demand. And it's just, although you have fewer, although there are fewer people in the rental pool that can afford your rent, there's still enough to find a renter because you only need one. Right. Right. Where if you have a, a rental property, that's more of a commodity there's nothing that really d differentiates you from the next person, then it, it seems like, especially if we get a recession, unemployment rate goes up, plus you have uh, people's wages going down in real terms, that there could be some, there could be some problems there. Yeah. And you know, one of the other things that's probably worth talking about that, you know, you hear 
people talking about this around the margins, but not significantly, and there aren't good stats on it. But I can tell you uh, just anecdotally, right? The Airbnb market has really been suffering. Okay. Mm, that's what I've heard. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of people went into that buying houses that never made sense as long term rentals. Oh, right. And they've been right. thrashed. I mean, look, when the economy turns down and people are pinched, the first thing they eliminate is vacation. Right. right. And admittedly, not all Airbnb properties are vacation only, right? Some of them are business and corporate and, you know, so forth, but largely it's a vacation business. And so, uh, you know, they're not getting anywhere near the type of income they expected. And Mm -hmm. so now they can't, those properties don't perform and they're dumping those properties onto the market. Right. Right, right, And the Airbnb properties largely aren't entry level properties. That's what's been the great thing about it as an investor, like you could play in a market of more expensive homes and make them pencil if they were short-term rentals, but those will never pencil as long-term rentals, not even close, not even by a mile. And so people are liquidating those properties. And this is especially true in like the Phoenix market. Okay. Mm -hmm. And also the Nashville market with, these are two really hot Airbnb markets. Right. And so um, uh, a lot of these properties have now recycled into the resale market. And they're, they just don't work, right? So, so that has increased inventory in certain price ranges and certain product types uh, that just don't work as, as short-term rentals anymore. Yeah, so not at the starter home level, but the, the two or three notches above that. Yeah, exactly. So in Phoenix, as an example, like an 800 or 900 you know, million yep. dollar home, something like that, right. out towards uh, Whole Foods in Scottsdale. Yeah. <laughs> that was penciling because you could rent it for whatever, 15 grand a month or something. Right. But, yeah. but now you can't. So if you have a long-term renter, you can only get five grand a month. Yeah. And and you're and you're completely cash flow negative. Exactly. You can't even get close to that 1% ideal on a long-term rental, which is $8,000 in your $800,000 example. Not even right. close. So, so those people are dumping their properties on the market. They are distressed. Um, and so, you know, there are little signs of distress, but overall, largely like, from a national basis, there's very little distress in the market. I mean, homeowners are sitting on largely just mountains of equity more than ever before, at least in nominal dollars. Uh, you know, there, there's just very little distress in the market, but there is some distress definitely around the edges. Yeah. So I guess that's some good news. If you're someone that's looking for a house at that price point in some of those markets, just try to maybe Tick, uh, kick some tires and look for something that might be a str- distressed property due to that Airbnb dynamic that you're looking for. Yep. And maybe, you know, you can get a good deal if you need to buy a house for maybe a reason other than just uh, having a good financial investment. Yeah, absolutely. You know, there's another interesting dynamic and there's a couple other kind of outlier dynamics maybe we should talk about too. Your, your viewers and listeners might be interested in. Um, So, you know, during tough times, what do people do? They rent less, they lower their expectations, they buy less, you know, they they can't buy as much as they used to. Uh, We we saw this and I predicted this before the rates went up uh, early last year, I predicted this, how you'd see a lot of builder cancellations and those people need to readjust their expectations, right? And they, they could no longer afford the house they bought. So they wouldn't qualify. They had to cancel the contract. And then they have to decide, well, do we keep renting if they were a first time buyer? uh, Or do we simply buy a less expensive house that we can actually qualify for? Uh, You know, and if that construction cycle was eight months out from, you know, the the time they purchased to when they were expected to close, uh, you know, that, that really makes a lot of work for the home builders, right? Because they've got to switch buyers up. But ultimately, people do readjust their expectations. But what happens when they don't? Well, they readjust them in a different way. If they don't think, okay, we'll just rent less, we'll buy less, we'll accept less. It would be like moving from a city like uh, Jacksonville, Florida, to New York City. You know you're going to get much more in Jacksonville, where you used to live, than where you're moving to, New York City, which is much more expensive, right? Yeah, right. But the other thing they do is they double up. 
and uh, or they live at home, right? <laughs> you know, they're 40 year old. I mean, I can't tell you the number of women I have dated in their 30s that are living with their parents. Like that never happened a couple decades ago. Sounds it's, like you should well, date some different women, dude. That's pretty. Well, <laughs> I guess I wasn't dating women in their 30s a couple decades ago either. That might but, okay. say more about your yeah. taste in women than it does the overall market, my friend. <laughs> no, that's the overall market, actually. Because, um, you know, there's just this like sort of refusal to kind of grow up. Right. You know, which is which is just interesting, you know, like that movie failure to launch. They made a whole movie about it. Right. But that was a guy. Um, but uh, whatever, you know, so so they have that. But it's interesting that there are even companies addressing this phenomenon, not about living at home, but about doubling up. There's one company called Pad Split That's an interesting like venture funded tech tech company, in essence. And uh, what they're doing is addressing the low, low end of the housing market, like people that would be maybe living in their car or, or homeless, uh, wow. where they take a traditional home. And I'm sure the neighbors hate this, like na neighborhoods usually hate Airbnb and short term right. rentals because they don't want right. all the transient people. This must be worse, right? Uh, they'll take a traditional house and it might be four bedrooms and they'll turn it into, you know, seven or eight bedrooms. They'll take all the common areas, literally, except the kitchen, bathrooms, and hallways, and split them up by adding walls. So they'll take the family room and the living room, turn it into two or three bedrooms, right? They'll have so They're basically people. taking houses back to the way they were in the 1950s. Actually, that's a very good point. You know, yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Uh, and they'll, they'll get, you know, seven, eight, ten people to move into these houses and yeah. pay 300 bucks a piece. Yeah, and yeah. that'll make the house pencil really well. Uh, a lot of people that won't even have cars or transportation. Uh, so there won't be a lot of cars clogging up the street. And uh, it's just interesting. I'm interested to see how that goes. Uh, yeah, you know, I mean, I, it's the same thing here. Yeah. I mean, like as an example, this apartment that I'm in, you know, it was one of my rentals. I've lived here probably the last year. And it's about, I'd say, 2,500 square feet, mm -hmm. roughly. Yep. And when I bought this place, it was like a traditional Colombian, you know, penthouse condo mm -hmm. where that 2,500 square feet was like five, six rooms. Right. And, you know, these little teeny weeny rooms where you can barely get in there. There's just a little bed in a closet. Yeah. And then they throw in three bathrooms or whatever. They got a little maid's quarters in the back. They got a little teeny weeny kitchen and like yeah. a common area. And and that's what like every every apartment in Columbia that was built prior to about 2000 Mm -hmm. You know, that's the way they were set up. Right. Uh, you've got an 800 square foot apartment and that's going to be three bed, two bath. Yeah. And, and so again, you know, the same with the United States in the 1950s. In fact, remember when I first got in the game in 2012, that's one of the things that we would do is you'd go in there and buy one of these five bedroom homes, but you'd turn it into a three bed, two bath Yeah. because it was more appropriate for right. what people wanted today. Open floor plan, open kitchen, et cetera. Sure. But now they're just, it's like back to the future. Yeah, yeah. Well, it is back to the future. And it'll be interesting to see how many people really double up like that. I, I think we'll, we'll see more of that. Yeah, that's probably the release valve, right? Because we were talking about how, okay, if rents are going up, home prices going up, mortgages going up, that you can't have that if incomes are going down. Right. Something has to give. Yep. So maybe that's what we'll see as far as that trend over the next five years is people just more and more and more people moving in to a smaller space. Yeah, we're definitely going to see some of that. Uh, but at the same time, you know, there's a lot of people getting a lot richer and, uh, you know, they're, they're closer to the money. So they've got the Cantillon effect working in their favor. Right. And, um, you know, they tend to be in businesses or industries that provide a lot of leverage. And uh, whether it be technology or media or these types of things where you can just kind of multiply yourself in one way or another, where, you know, uh, there's a great quote, um, you know, wealth is when small efforts produce big results and poverty is when big efforts produce small results, right? Mm. And so, you know, there are there's like a, a big part of the population that is that gets this, that understands this and has taken advantage of it. So we really are losing the middle, which right. scares me. I just don't like that. I mean, the middle class has been ho hollowed out for decades now and it's just accelerating. 
Uh, and I think this bodes very badly for the stability of the country. But nonetheless, it's it's definitely happening. So if you're a normal homeowner, let's just take your real estate investor hat off for a moment. Yep. And uh, well, this is maybe applicable to you because you're trying to actually sell your house right yep. now and you've gone through this process. And then I don't know if you're going to try to rent or well, that's a good question. So when let's assume that you sell your house, it's for sale right now in the next uh you know, two, three months, something like that. Yep. What's your game plan or in this market, just from a personal level, are you going to rent and try to like, you know, try to see how the market plays out? Or are you going to go right ahead and buy or what's your game plan? You know, I um, have like this sort of uh, uh, covetous part of my personality that I'm trying to do away with. <laughs> and, you know, George, you've done a very good job of being kind of a minimalist, right? And I'm terrible at that. I've tried it over and over. I kind of beat myself up about it. But um, I just for a while want to be a little bit nomadic. And I've done that before a couple of times in my life. Uh, it's it's great to be a nomad when you've got money, right? And resources. Uh, it's uh, it's certainly fun. And, um, you know, I, I kind of want to see where I live. I want to I want to live in Medellin where you live for a month, right? And see how I like it. Uh, there are several American cities, including oddly, uh, don't laugh too hard, but Salt Lake City, I've always liked quite a bit. I just don't like the cold. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I would live there for a month. I'd even live in New York City for a month just to experience it, although I'm not a fan of New York City, I don't think. <laughs> but, you know, I just want to kind of try some different stuff, uh, maybe a few cities in Europe and, um, you know, kind of just figure it out. No, no, no pressure. You know, I, I don't feel bad. I don't feel like I'm missing out. The only time you feel like you're missing out is if you don't own investment properties, right? You don't need to own the house in which you live. In fact, I find that to be a great inconvenience um, because I'd be on my uh, fun journey right now, probably down there with you, uh, if I didn't own this house, right? Yeah. So let me let me ask telling. let me ask the question a little bit different way here. Okay. Assume that you had no income properties, right? You, you and you didn't like real estate. You never got into the business. Let's say you were in a completely separate uh, deal, right? Yep. Would you would you have ever bought a house? Or would you just be, because like me, remember before 2012, before I retired, I, I never owned anything. I, oh, really? I, and that was, you know, I retired when I was 38 years old mm -hmm. and I had never owned a piece of property. Yeah. I had always rented and I was just totally happy. I with, did not know that. that. Yeah. 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 So do you think you would have fallen into that category as just being a perpetual rent? You know, why, why buy? Or do you think you would have tried to purchase I, something and I then, think, and then would you yeah. do it in this market? You know, as the market is right now with higher mortgage rates, very high prices, what would you do? It would have depended on my socioeconomic status, right? I mean, if I was making, you know, 60 grand a year there, you know, I probably would have wanted to buy a house, but maybe I couldn't really afford it easily. Uh, but, you know, I've, I've always pretty much made like really good money ever since I was really young. And so, um, you know, I, I would have, I'm sure, just fallen into the normal thing of buy a house. And, you know, mm -hmm. most of the houses I've lived in, I've owned, right? So I've mostly purchased houses, right? Uh, but every time you want to move with you want to try something else, you got to sell it, you got to go through the hassle, you got to have the invasion of privacy. It's really a pain, uh, you know, uh, selling your house. Right. But would you buy in this market? With the prices this high, because I know you don't like to live in starter homes, right? right? So, yeah. and you like to live in some, maybe some of those cyclical areas. Yeah. So, would you be buying, or would you be like, "Well, I'm going to sit this one out. I'm going to rent for the next year and see how the recession plays out, and see if I might be able to get a better price later." Based on my current thinking, I would probably end up back in Scottsdale, Arizona which was one of my favorite places to live. No place mm -hmm. is perfect, but that'd be definitely at the top of my list. A couple other cities in Florida I'd also consider. Um, right now, I would, like, I almost, I did buy a house in Scottsdale uh, last year, and um, I guess, thankfully, look in the rearview mirror, the deal fell through. Uh, so, and that was, uh, I think, like $2.2 million. Um, and uh, I'm glad I didn't get it because that house ended up selling for quite a bit less than I had paid for it. Uh, oh, really? So that was good. Uh, blessing in disguise. But um, right now I would, I would wait a little longer if I was trying to time the high end market in a place right. like Scottsdale. I think that's coming down, uh, you know, another good 10%. Yeah, maybe a little sense. more. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. 
So what do you see uh, mortgage rates doing throughout the rest of 2023? So if I'm someone that's thinking about buying a house, uh, you know, right now I can lock in a 30 year fixed rate mortgage at, I'm guessing 7% right around yeah. there, maybe 6.5. Do you do that? Or do you say, well, maybe I could get a better deal if we go into a recession and the Fed drops rates? How would you play that one? You know, it, you're always, you marry the property, you date the rate as the saying goes. Uh, you can always <laughs> refinance it. That's, yeah. that's a good yeah. one. Yeah. You marry the property, you date the rate. Um, but uh, so you can always renegotiate the deal. That's one of the great things about real estate. It allows you to kind of renegotiate the deal along the way. The deal you make initially is never the final deal. Um, I am amazed that the Fed actually hiked the rates at the last meeting. Um, they might do it one more time. Who knows? But um, man, it's... Uh, uh, I, I mean, they're going to push us into an official declared recession at some point, and they're going right. to have to pivot. Um, I, I think they always are just tend to favor inflation uh, over the alternative. I mean, things are breaking. Uh, banks are under distress. I can't imagine they're going to stick to this path. It, it's, it's really kind of shocking me because Jerome Powell was so accommodative for so long and, you know, he just felt like Alan Greenspan, right? Or Ben Bernanke, helicopter, right? Helicopter Ben. But then he turned into Paul Volcker. I mean, what happened to that guy? Is he just got a total split personality. I, I mean, I'm kind of amazed that they've really been so hawkish. Well, I think it's uh, when he thought that inflation was the, or disinflation, deflation was the actual problem. They were trying to get inflation, then he's Ben Bernanke. But when he realizes that inflation is the problem, then it dawns on him that history is going to remember him one of two ways. Yep. It's Arthur Burns or Paul Volcker. Right. And he wants to make sure that he's remembered as Paul Volcker, not Arthur Burns, for obvious reasons. And so I think that if he's going to err on one side or the other, he's going to err on the side of taking rates too high. Yeah. Um, just because then, you know, what's your downside there? Let's say you get a huge recession and inflation comes down, then you're the hero. Then, then you're Paul Volcker. Then you say, oh, of course we got a recession. That's yeah. what I was trying to do. Right. And look at inflation. Now it's back down under 2%. Sure, the unemployment rate's at 10. But oh. what did you expect? That's exactly what Paul Volcker did. You know, that, yeah, that I don't know. His, his, I, it, it seems like the business plan for governments and central banks is inflation. And I just think they're always going to go in that direction. You know, I, I was listening to um, uh, Luke Grumman yesterday, a video uh, someone sent me and, and you know, you, you know him well. Uh, and he talked about Israel and their inflation rates in the 1980s. And, you know, he was just sort of cavalier about it, frankly. He was talking about how, look, they experienced 300 percent inflation. And they survived it, you know, everything adapted and adjusted. I can't imagine that was very pleasant. Uh, but it just seems like the danger of, you know, making the government debt so expensive, uh, all those treasury payments. I mean, suddenly treasuries look interesting. I mean, I can't believe I'm even saying that. But, you know, as a risk free return at 5%, you know, thank God, that's not that bad. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I just think ultimately the game plan is inflation, but well, that's the game plan in Japan as well. Yeah. It's always, you know, but having a game plan and executing are two completely different subjects, especially when it comes <laughs> to central planning. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's the Mike Tyson saying, right. Right. Until you get you punched always, in the nose. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the face. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what the free market. Or, or bitten in the ear. To, uh, what's that? <laughs> or you get your ear bitten off. Yeah. 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 yeah right. So we'll have to see. I, I think that, but I, I think what's going to most likely happen is you get some more disinflation. I think we might even see just like a quarter of deflation, like we saw in 2009, going into 2024, like maybe Q4 of 2023, mm -hmm. something yeah. like that. But I think the government's response to that will be. CARES Act 2.0, yeah. which is going to be $10 trillion instead of $5 trillion. And that's what takes you to that next wave of consumer price inflation. You know, if you look at a chart of the CPI in the 1940s and the 1970s, it doesn't go up in a straight line. 
-hmm. It's like a roller coaster. I mean, in 47, CPI was at 19%. Wow. And by 49, it was negative two, Jason. That's that's shocking. Yeah, you've we'll studied the 40s a lot more than I have. Negative that, two. That's, that's amazing. Do you know what year that was that it was 19%? Where in the 40s? Like the four after Bretton Woods or World War II? 47. Okay, yeah. Wow. 47. Because that's what amazing. happens, they had price controls. Uh -huh. And as soon as they took out the price controls, the inflation just ripped higher for the year. And then the, the, the supply was filled. And then two years later, you've got deflation of 2%. And then they go right into more government spending with another war. And that takes you know, in the early 50s. And that takes mm -hmm. you up to that next wave where the CPI got up to like 10 or 12%. That's really kind of shocking that two years or what, three years after, well, two years after the dollar became the reserve currency, right? And uh, the the U.S. had won the war, started to rebuild the world, um, that inflation would have been that high. I mean, was that just consumer uh, spending that drove that or, you know? What, no, price controls. Yeah. Right. So well, that yeah, but when the price controls like came off, I mean, what was the 40, real inflation? Not talking or, about central Well, demand. because when you have price controls, you reduce supply. Yeah. Right. So supply goes down to nothing, you know, between let's just say 44 and 46. Yeah. And 46, they say, okay, no more price controls. And then the demand's still high. That's what a price is going to do. They just rip higher, yep. you know, because there's been so little supply to fill all of that demand. But it's it's really not. Uh, uh, although there was an increase in monetary uh, in M two money supply, that's for sure. But there was a lot of variables that went into it. But it just goes to show you that that inflation never goes up in a straight line, and you can have an inflationary decade where prices at the end of the nineteen forties were. I mean, I don't. I haven't done the math, but I mean, let's just say they were you know, 50, 75 percent higher mm -hmm. than they were at the beginning of the nineteen forties. But yet you still had years of outright deflation yeah. during that. And so that that's how it works. And I think that's how the 2020s are going to play out. That's kind of my base case. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, you know, you mentioned price controls and uh, and then you mentioned San Diego uh, when we started talking today. And, um, uh, you know, there's a there's a, a big fight in San Diego. They want to institute even more rent controls than the state is now requiring. And so, so like citywide state. Yeah. City, it's, you know, new layers of rent control. I mean, this is just insanity. Talk about, you know, creating shortages. It, it's, it's really crazy. Yeah. You know, I just wrote this down because I didn't want to forget. I did a video the other day and I don't know if you saw this on Biden's new law that penalizes. Oh yeah. People I saw that one. Yeah. with uh high credit scores <laughs> to where you've got to pay like this these, is gonna work <laughs> yeah all these additional fees on right. on top of your mortgage rate if you have a good credit score yeah. right. it's so stupid yeah. so what this give me your rant on that one man oh You're man the real that, expert, that is so fucking stupid i can't even believe it I mean, <laughs> how, are, how are they gonna actually implement that so now now if 740 is the number i want to make sure my credit score i want to now manipulate it to where it's Down. 739, right? <laughs> I mean, this is just like the dumbest idea ever, right? I mean, these these people are complete freaking idiots. Yeah, that that is a good point. So what would you do if you had a 740 credit score and that was the line in the sand? Like, would you purposely like miss a credit card payment? I, yeah, I guess I'll have to like just break... default on purpose, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> where do they get uh... this stuff, man? <laughs> Yeah, but you know, unfortunately, I think where it goes from here, and this is kind of the the takeaway from the video, is that takes you straight into a central bank digital currency oh, because, yeah. you know, let's think about this. Right now, the narrative is, hey, there's this disadvantaged group or groups of people, and it's not fair that they they can't buy a home, so we need to level the playing field somehow. Yeah. So let's just lower their interest rate, right? Basically, and let's just increase the interest rate for the people who are actually responsible and paying their debts. And but then I'm sure the next step, Jason, is this going to be, well, why are we even charging them interest? That's yeah. not fair. Right. Right. We've got to level the playing field even more. Yeah. And then you say, well, what bank is going to give them a loan without charging them interest? Well, no bank other yeah. than the Fed. Right. So that means we all have to take our accounts from. Uh, that's yeah. right. Over to the yeah. Fed. And now they can extend credit completely based on narrative instead of merit. Mm -hmm. And that's really, I think, what they want. That's their end game. Yeah. Well, they'll be able to engineer a lot of these things much more easily with a CBDC. Uh, and that will be 
we will just be screwed. You know, that will be checkmate against the human race uh, when there is a global coordinated CBDC. Uh, you know, I just interviewed um, uh, the author of a book uh, called The Tower of Basel, meaning Basel, Switzerland, of course. Oh, so the Tower of Babel, ba Babel yeah, or yeah. the Bible story? Yeah, yeah, not the Bible story, Basel, Switzerland, right? The Tower right. of Basel. And uh, he, he uh, did this whole expose on the Bank of International Settlements. I interviewed him this morning. And, uh, you know, it is uh, really scary how these central bankers all get together, uh, you know, 200 of them typically, uh, they have like 200 meetings a year, right? Um, mm. And they coordinate things. And this Janet Yellen loves this, right? Oh, yeah. uh, because what they want to do is make it so there's nowhere to run. Right. So there's no place to escape to where you can have free currency uh, They're, You know, they're doing Operation Choke Point on the cryptocurrencies. Uh, that's going to continue. That's going to get even tougher. And um, it's uh, it's it's really bad news. Uh, as you know, when we were at the collective in Jekyll Island, George, uh, just a couple of months ago, interviewing G. Edward Griffin. Remember when he said he he did a Zoom presentation for everybody in the collective uh, yeah. mastermind, and he said, "You can't let this happen. You cannot let the CBDC happen because it it's just way too. It gives them way too much power." Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, talk about the BIS. I did a story on that the other day. Where they they came out with a new CBDC project. Yep. It's it's already in oh, effect. Yeah. They're they're coordinating that with three central banks. I think it was Norway, a Sweden. I forgot the other one, but they're calling it Project Icebreaker. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is exactly. And if you look at that, that they call it the Icebreaker Hub. Basically, what that is is just it's either the BIS or the IMF that's going to act as the central bank to the central banks themselves. And within the local country, that central bank will have a CBDC. And then the CBDC for the central banks, basically their reserve asset, will be issued by the, the BIS, the World Economic Forum, the IMF, you know, yeah. you name it. This is their kind of their, their game plan, if you will. And I mean, they're going to do this. It's just a it's it's a it's a no brainer for them. I, I mean, they will have so much convenience. Well, they're going to try, have, but it, I think, you know, at the end of the day, we, the people yeah. have the power. Let's, let's hope we do. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I was talking to Daniela or I think it was Daniela mm -hmm. who was Stansberry the other day. Yeah. And that's what I was saying. I, I, I said, the good news is, is yeah. we have the power to do this. The truckers were a great example of that. Yeah. You know, I told her, I said, I, I think it was her. Maybe it was a different interview, but anyway, I told the, the interviewer, I said, I believe that if it wasn't for Russia invading Ukraine, and this can take you down a whole another conspiracy theory, right. I think that Trudeau would have been out. And mm -hmm. I think that, that that trucker movement would have completely changed the world. I mean, they had trucker movements going in the United States, in yeah. Europe, in uh, uh, New Zealand, I mean, all over the world. And I think it would have completely changed the face of government and we would have shifted back towards much more individualism freedom and liberty and privacy and all these things. But then you had the war and then all of a sudden nobody's talking about the truckers anymore. But the good news is that gives us an example of what can be done if we all come together. Absolutely. And, you know, everybody must rewatch the old movie that you've probably seen. I saw it years ago called Wag the Dog, right? I, haven't, I, I never saw that. Oh, my gosh. You must see that movie. And it's all about how they manipulate the media to manipulate public opinion and they distract us from things by creating a new crisis. I mean, George, it's right wow. up your alley. You, you'll love it. Yeah. Uh, Wag the dog, a must see movie for sure. Um, but hey, George, I, I want to ask you about something that I don't really hear you speak to very much. Um, and I want to talk about this at Rebel Capitalist Live. I'm, I'm really excited to. You know, I've always said that there's basically this sort of war going on. On one side, you have bad fiscal and monetary policy, which is very inflationary. And on the other side, you have technology, which is deflationary. And I think this war is, between, you know, who will win this, this uh, terrible time in history we're in, in, in many ways, but great time in other ways, amazing time. Um, you know, 
AI is all the rage since last November when ChatGPT was launched. Um, there are a lot of things that are pretty amazing where, you know, that would kind of indicate that we're at an inflection point. Now, of course, this technology can be used for evil and it will be. Uh, but, um, you know, technology is a deflationary force for sure. And just as software already ate the world, AI is going to eat it even more, right? So, uh, you know, do you have much thoughts about this? I, I don't hear you talk about it too much. Well, I, I think that the in, in that battle, I think inflation wins because yeah. uh, technology is a result of the free market and the free market working sure. well. That's what you get. You naturally have lower prices, but the government can screw that up. And if the, let, let's look at communist Russia, you know, you didn't have much tech coming out of communist Russia because the free market wasn't allowed to work, although there was a lot of human capital there. And so let, you know, going back to the central bank digital currency, the more central planning you have, the more it distorts the economy and the less efficient it is. So if you are to assume that everything moves to the Fed's balance sheet and they're the ones that are going to be allocating capital, we can also assume they're not going to do it well. They're going to distort the economy and you're going to have much less innovation and you're going to have less tech as a result. Right. Yeah. And you're going to have the supply of stuff being reduced dramatically. Right. While at the same time, you have an increase in the number of currency units. So I think that uh, that that's going to be our, 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 our challenge moving forward. And unfortunately that incredible benefit that uh, is picked up by society through deflation, I think is going to be overwhelmed by the government. I don't think it's going to be, uh, we're not going to, there's going to be too many regulations. It's going to be too micromanaged. I mean, it's, it's, you're like living through Atlas Shrugged. Yeah. And remember the technology that they talked about in Atlas Shrugged. The, the motor. Yeah. Yeah. And, re and remember yeah. what they did to Reardon and all that yeah. stuff. And they I think they're going to do the exact same thing in real life in the 2020s. All right. Well, the good thing is that it's much more uh, distributed than it was in Atlas Shrugged, right? And and things and this kind of knowledge is, is just much more distributed than it ever has been. And yeah, it is harder to control. That's yeah. true. Because instead right. of going after that steel plant, now what you have to do is you have to somehow try to micromanage a decentralized ledger like Bitcoin. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Example. And, and let's hope they can never that. do that. Yeah. Yeah. All right, man. Well, I'm going to go ahead and leave it there. I got to shoot over to physical therapy. So okay. uh, I want to remind everyone to get their tickets to Rebel Capitalist Live at rebelcapitalistlive.com. It's going to be an amazing event. I'm really, really excited. And, you know, so many people come up to me or, no, well, they do come up to me when I meet them in the street, but also in the, in the uh, comments on social media and whatnot. They always say, okay, George, I get it. There's a recession coming. We've got these problems. We've got the government breathing down our necks, but what do we do about it? And I'm like, well, the, the first thing you can do is come to Rebel Capitalist Live so you can not only interact with the speakers like yourself, you know, have a beer, ask them a direct question, but you can also network with your fellow Rebel Capitalists and really, uh, I think, really uh, get motivated to come together and push back against all these Orwellian uh, you know, this Orwellian dystopian type of future that the central planners are trying to create. And uh, I think that's really the biggest benefit. But uh, anyway, got to get your tickets at rebelcapitalistlive.com. For more people who want to find out about what you do, where can they go, Jason? Um, JasonHartman.com or a podcast and YouTube, any podcast platform, just type Jason Hartman or uh, YouTube, same thing. All right, buddy. Enjoy right. the rest of your day. I look forward to seeing you in Orlando. Okay. Happy investing, everybody.